Chapters one to six, book one, volume one of Le Mort de Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Le Mort de Arthur, volume one, by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book one, chapters one to six. Chapter one. It befell in the days of Uther Pendragon, when he was king of all England and so reigned, that there was a mighty duke in Cornwall that held war against him long time, and the duke was called the Duke of Tintagel. And so, by means, King Uther sent for this duke, charging him to bring his wife with him, for she was called a fair lady, and a passing wise, and her name was Igraine. So when the duke and his wife were come unto the king, by the means of great lords they were accorded both. The king liked and loved this lady well, and he made them great cheer out of measure, and desired to have lain by her. But she was a passing good woman, and would not assent unto the king. And then she told the duke her husband, and said, I suppose that we were sent for that I should be dishonoured. Wherefore, husband, I counsel you, that we depart from hence suddenly, that we may ride all night unto our own castle. And in likewise, as she said, so they departed, that neither the king nor none of his council were aware of their departing. All so soon as King Uther knew of their departing so suddenly, he was wonderly wroth. Then he called to him his privy council, and told them of the sudden departing of the duke and his wife. Then they advised the king to send for the duke and his wife by a great charge. And if it will not come at your summons, then may ye do your best. Then have ye cause to make mighty war upon him. So that was done, and the messengers had their answers, and that was this shortly, that neither he nor his wife would not come at him. Then was the king wonderly wroth. And then the king sent him plain word again, and bade him be ready, and stuff him, and garnish him, for within forty days he would fetch him out of the biggest castle that he hath. When the duke had this warning, anon he went and furnished and garnished two strong castles of his, of the which the one height Tintagel, and the other castle height Terrible. So his wife, Dame Igraine, he put in the castle of Tintagel, and himself he put in the castle of Terrible the which had many issues and posterns out. Then in all haste came Uther with a great host, and laid a siege about the castle of Terrible. And there he piped many pavilions, and there was great war made on both parties, and much people slain. Then for pure anger, and for great love of fair Igraine, the king Uther fell sick. So came to the king Uther Sir Ulfius, a noble knight, and asked the king why he was sick. "'I shall tell thee,' said the king, "'I am sick for anger and for love of the fair Igraine, "'that I may not be whole.' "'Well, my lord,' said Sir Ulfius, "'I shall seek Merlin, "'and he shall do you remedy, "'that your heart shall be pleased.' So Ulfius departed, and by adventure he met Merlin in a beggar's array, and there Merlin asked Ulfius whom he sought. "'and he said he had little ado to tell him. "'Well,' said Merlin, "'I know whom thou seekest, "'for thou seekest Merlin. "'Therefore seek no farther, for I am he, "'and if King Uther will well reward me, "'and be sworn unto me to fulfil my desire, "'that shall be his honour and profit more than mine, "'for I shall cause him to have all his desire. "'All this I will undertake,' said Ulfius. "'that there shall be nothing reasonable, but thou shalt have thy desire.' "'Well,' said Merlin, "'he shall have his intent and desire. "'And therefore,' said Merlin, "'ride on your way, for I will not be long behind.' CHAPTER Two. Then Alpheus was glad, and rode on more than a pace till he came to King Uther Pendragon, and told him he had met with Merlin. "'Where is he?' said the king. "'Sir,' said Ulfius, "'he will not dwell long.' 
Therewithal Alpheus was where, where Merlin stood, at the porch of the pavilion's door. And then Merlin was bound to come to the king. When King Uther saw him, he said he was welcome. Sir, said Merlin, I know all your heart every deal, so ye will be sworn unto me as ye be a true king anointed. To fulfil my desire, ye shall have your desire. Then the king was sworn upon the four evangelists. Sir, said Merlin, this is my desire. The first night that ye shall lie by a grain, ye shall get a child on her, and when that is born, then it shall be delivered to me, for to nourish there as I will have it. For it shall be your worship, and the child's avail, as mickle as the child is worth. I will well, said the king, as thou wilt have it. Now make you ready, said Merlin, this night ye shall lie with a grain in the castle of Tintagel, and ye shall be like the duke her husband. Ulfius shall be like Sir Brastius, a knight of the duke's, and I will be like a knight that hight Sir Jordanus, a knight of the duke's. But wait ye make not many questions with her, nor her men, but say ye are diseased, and so hie to your bed, and rise not on the morn till I come to you, for the castle of Tintagel is but ten miles hence. So this was done as they devised. But the duke of Tintagel espied how the king rode from the siege of Terrible, and therefore that night he issued out of the castle at a postern, for to have distressed the king's host. And so, through his own issue, the duke himself was slain, or ever the king came at the castle of Tintagel. So, after the death of the duke, King Uther lay with the grain more than three hours after his death, and begat on her that night Arthur. And on day came Merlin to the king, and bade him make him ready. And so he kissed the lady a grain, and departed in all haste. But, when the lady heard tell of the duke her husband, and by all record he was dead, or ever King Uther came to her, then she marvelled who that might be that lay with her in likeness of her lord. So she mourned privily, and held her peace. Then all the barons by one assent prayed the king of accord betwixt the lady Agraine and him. The king gave them leave, for fain would he have been accorded with her. So the king put all the trust in Ulfius to entreat between them. So by the entreaty at the last the king and she met together. Now will we do well, said Ulfius. Our king is a lusty knight, and wifeless, and my lady Agraine is a passing fair lady. It were great joy unto us all, and it might please the king to make her his queen. Unto that they all well accorded and moved it to the king, and anon, like a lusty knight, he assented thereto with good will, and so in all haste they were married in a morning with great mirth and joy. And King Lot of Lothian and of Orkney then wedded Morgays, that was Gawain's mother, and King Nentres of the land of Garlot wedded Elaine. All this was done at the request of King Uther, and the third sister, Morgan le Fay, was put to school in a nunnery, and there she learned so much that she was a great clerk of necromancy. And after she was wedded to King Urien's of the land of Gore, that was Sir Ewan's, Le Blanchemain's father. Chapter 3 Then Queen Igraine waxed daily greater and greater, so it befell after within half a year, as King Uther lay by his queen, he asked her, by the faith she owed to him, whose was the child within her body. Then she saw a bash to give answer. Dismay you not, said the king, but tell me the truth, and I shall love you the better, by the faith of my body. Sir, said she, I shall tell you the truth. The same night that my lord was dead, the hour of his death, as his knights record, there came into my castle of Tintagel, a man like my lord, in speech and in countenance, and two knights with him, in likeness of his two knights Brastius and Jordanus. And so I went unto bed with him, as I ought to do with my lord. And the same night, as I shall answer unto God, this child was begotten upon me. That is truth, said the king, as ye say, 
for it was I myself that came in the likeness, and therefore dismay you not, for I am father of the child. And there he told her all the cause, how it was by Merlin's counsel. Then the queen made great joy when she knew who was the father of her child. Soon came Merlin unto the king, and said, Sir, ye must purvey you for the nourishing of your child. As thou wilt, said the king, be it. Well, said Merlin, I know a lord of yours in this land, that is a passing true man and a faithful, and he shall have the nourishing of your child, and his name is Sir Ector, and he is a lord of fair livelihood in many parts in England and Wales. And this lord, Sir Ector, let him be sent for, for to come and speak with you, and desire him yourself, as he loveth you, that he will put his own child to nourishing to another woman, and that his wife nourish yours. And when the child is born, let it be delivered to me at yonder privy postern unchristened. So, like as Merlin devised, it was done. And when Sir Ector was come, he made fiancé to the king, for to nourish the child like as the king desired. And there the king granted Sir Ector great rewards. Then, when the lady was delivered, the king commanded two knights and two ladies to take the child, bound in a cloth of gold, and that ye deliver him to what poor man ye meet at the postern gate of the castle. So the child was delivered unto Merlin, and so he bare it forth unto Sir Ector, and made an holy man to christen him, and named him Arthur. And so Sir Ector's wife nourished him with her own pap. CHAPTER Four. Then, within two years, King Uther fell sick of a great malady, and in the meanwhile his enemies usurped upon him, and did a great battle upon his men, and slew many of his people. Sir, said Merlin, ye may not lie so as ye do, for ye must to the field, though ye ride on a horse-litter, for ye shall never have the better of your enemies, but if your person be there, and then shall ye have the victory. So it was done as Merlin had devised, and they carried the king forth in a horse-litter with a great host towards his enemies. And at St. Albans there met with the king a great host of the north. And that day Sir Ulfius and Sir Brastius did great deeds of arms, and King Uther's men overcame the northern battle, and slew many people, and put the remnant to flight. And then the king returned unto London, and made great joy of his victory. And then he fell passing sore sick, so that three days and three nights he was speechless. Wherefore all the barons made great sorrow, and asked Merlin what counsel were best. There is none other remedy, said Merlin, but God will have his will. But look ye all barons be before King Uther to mourn, and God and I shall make him to speak. So on the morn all the barons with Merlin came to fore the king. Then Merlin said aloud unto King Uther, Sir, shall your son Arthur be king after your days, of this realm with all the appurtenance? Then Uther Pendragon turned him, and said in hearing of them all, I give him God's blessing and mine, and bid him prayer for my soul, and righteously and worshipfully that he claim the crown, upon forfeiture of my blessing. And therewith he yielded up the ghost, and there was he interred, as longed to a king. Wherefore the queen, fairy grain, made great sorrow, and all the barons. CHAPTER V Then stood the realm in great jeopardy long while, for every lord that was mighty of men made him strong, and many weaned to have been king. Then Merlin went to the Archbishop of Canterbury, and counselled him for to send for all the lords of the realm, and all the gentlemen of arms, that they should to London come by Christmas, upon pain of cursing. And for this cause, that Jesus, that was born on that night, that he would of his great mercy show some miracle, as he was come to be king of mankind, for to show some miracle who should be right wise king of this realm. So the archbishop, by the advice of Merlin, 
sent for all the lords and gentlemen of arms, that they should come by Christmas even unto London. And many of them made them clean of their life, that their prayer might be the more acceptable unto God. So, in the greatest church of London, whether it were Paul's or not, the French book maketh no mention. All the estates were long or day in the church for to pray. And when Martin's and the first mass was done, there was seen in the churchyard, against the high altar, a great stone four square, like unto a marble stone, and in the midst thereof was like an anvil of steel a foot on high. And therein struck a fair sword naked by the point, and letters there were written in gold about the sword, that said thus, Whoso pulleth out this sword of this stone and anvil, is rightwise king born of all England. Then the people marvelled, and told it to the archbishop. I command, said the archbishop, that ye keep you within your church, and pray unto God still, that no man touch the sword till the high mass be all done. So when all masses were done, all the lords went to behold the stone and the sword. And when they saw the scripture, some assayed, such as would have been king. But none might stir the sword, nor move it. He is not here, said the archbishop, that shall achieve the sword. But doubt not God will make him known. But this is my counsel, said the archbishop, that we let purvey ten knights, men of good fame, and they to keep this sword. So it was ordained, and then there was made a cry, that every man should assay that would, for to win the sword. And upon New Year's Day the barons let make a joust and a tournament, that all knights that would joust or tourney there might play, and all this was ordained for to keep the lords together and the commons. For the archbishop trusted that God would make him known that should win the sword. So upon New Year's Day, when the service was done, the barons rode unto the field, some to joust and some to tawny. And so it happened that Sir Ector, that had great livelihood about London, rode unto the jousts, and with him rode Sir Kay his son, and young Arthur that was his nourished brother. And Sir Kay was made knight at all hallow mass afore. So as they rode to the jousts ward, Sir Kay lost his sword, for he had left it at his father's lodging, and so he prayed young Arthur for to ride for his sword. I will well, said Arthur, and rode fast after the sword. And when he came home, the lady and all were out to see the jousting. Then was Arthur wroth, and said to himself, I will ride to the churchyard, and take the sword with me that sticketh in the stone, for my brother Sir Kay shall not be without a sword this day. So when he came to the churchyard, Sir Arthur alighted, and tied his horse to the stile, and so he went to the tent, and found no knights there, for they were at the jousting. And so he handled the sword by the handles, and lightly and fiercely pulled it out of the stone, and took his horse and rode his way until he came to his brother Sir Kay, and delivered him the sword. And as soon as Sir Kay saw the sword, he wist well it was the sword of the stone. And so he rode to his father Sir Ector, and said, Sir, lo, here is the sword of the stone, wherefore I must be king of this land. When Sir Ector beheld the sword, he returned again and came to the church, and there they alighted all three and went into the church. And anon he made Sir Kay swear upon a book how he came to that sword. Sir, said Sir Kay, by my brother Arthur, for he brought it to me. How gat ye this sword? said Sir Ector to Arthur. Sir, I will tell you, when I came home from my brother's sword, I found nobody at home to deliver me his sword, and so I thought my brother Kay should not be swordless, and so I came hither eagerly, and pulled it out of the stone without any pain. Found ye any knights about this sword? said Sir Ector. Nay, said Arthur. Now, said Sir Ector to Arthur, I understand ye must be king of this land. 
Wherefore I, said Arthur, and for what cause? Sir, said Hector, for God will have it so, for there should never man have drawn out this sword, but he that shall be rightwise king of this land. Now let me see whether you can put the sword there as it was, and pull it out again. That is no mastery, said Arthur, and so he put it in the stone, wherewithal Sir Ector essayed to pull out the sword, and failed. CHAPTER Six. Now essay, said Sir Ector unto Sir Kay, and anon he pulled at the sword with all his might, but it would not be. Now shall ye essay, said Sir Ector to Arthur. I will well, said Arthur, and pulled it out easily. And therewithal Sir Ector knelt down to the earth, and Sir Kay. Alas, said Arthur, my own dear father and brother, why kneel ye to me? Nay, nay, my lord Arthur, it is not so. I was never your father, nor of your blood. But I wot well ye are of an higher blood than I weened ye were. And then Sir Ector told him all. How he was betaken him for to nourish him, and by whose commandment, and by Merlin's deliverance. Then Arthur made great dole when he understood that Sir Ector was not his father. Sir, said Ector unto Arthur, Will ye be my good and gracious lord when ye are king? Else were I to blame, said Arthur, for ye are the man in the world that I am most beholden to, and my good lady and mother your wife, that as well as her own hath fostered me and kept. And if ever it be God's will that I be king as ye say, ye shall desire of me what I may do, and I shall not fail you. God forbid I should fail you, sir, said Sir Ector. I will ask no more of you, but that ye will make my son, your foster-brother, Sir Kay, seneschal of all your lands. That shall be done, said Arthur, and more, by the faith of my body, that never man shall have that office but he, while he and I live. Therewithal they went unto the archbishop, and told him how the sword was achieved, and by whom and on the twelfth day all the barons came thither, and to assay to take the sword, who that would assay. But there afore them all, there might none take it out but Arthur. Wherefore there were many lords wroth, and said it was great shame unto them all and the realm, to be overgoverned with a boy of no high blood born. And so they fell out at that time, that it was put off till Candlemas, and then all the barons should meet there again. But always the ten knights were ordained to watch the sword night and day, and so they set a pavilion over the stone and the sword, and five always watched. So at Candlemas many more great lords came thither for to have won the sword, but there might none prevail. And right as Arthur did at Christmas, he did at Candlemas, and pulled out the sword easily, whereof the barons were sore aggrieved, and put it off in delay till the high feast of Easter. And, as Arthur sped before, so did he at Easter. Yet there were some of the great lords had indignation that Arthur should be king, and put it off in a delay till the feast of Pentecost. Then the Archbishop of Canterbury, by Merlin's providence, let purvey then of the best knights that they might get, and such knights as Uther Pendragon loved best, and most trusted in his days. And such knights were put about Arthur as Sir Baudwin of Britain, Sir Kay, Sir Ulfius, Sir Brastius. All these, with many others, were always about Arthur, day and night, till the Feast of Pentecost. End of Book 1, Chapters 1 to 6《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます》《ラブの歌を歌うことができます
All manner of men essay to pull at the sword that would essay. But none might prevail but Arthur, and pulled it out afore all the lords and commons that were there. Wherefore all the commons cried at once, We will have Arthur unto our king, we will put him no more in delay, for we all see that it is God's will that he shall be our king, and who that holdeth against it, we will slay him. And therewithal they kneeled at once, both rich and poor, and cried Arthur mercy, because they had delayed him so long. And Arthur forgave them, and took the sword between both his hands, and offered it upon the altar where the archbishop was. And so was he made knight of the best man that was there. And so anon was the coronation made. And there was he sworn unto his lords and the commons, for to be a true king, to stand with true justice from thenceforth the days of this life. Also then he made all the lords that held of the crown to come in, and to do service as they ought to do. And many complaints were made unto Sir Arthur of great wrongs that were done since the death of King Uther, of many lands that were bereaved lords, knights, ladies, and gentlemen, whereof King Arthur made the lands to be given again unto them that owned them. When this was done, that the king had established all the countries about London, then he let make Sir Kay Sensual of England, and Sir Bedouin of Britain was made constable, and Sir Ulfius was made chamberlain, and Sir Brastius was made warden to wait upon the north from Trent forwards, for it was that time the most party the king's enemies. But within few years after Arthur won all the north, Scotland, and all that were under their obeisance, also Wales, a part of it, held against Arthur, but he overcame them all, as he did the remnant, through the noble prowess of himself and his knights of the round table. CHAPTER Eight. Then the king removed into Wales, and let cry a great feast that it should be holden at Pentecost, after the incoronation of him at the city of Carleon. Unto the feast came King Lot of Lothian and of Orkney, with five hundred knights with him. Also there came to the feast King Urians of Gore, with four hundred knights with him. Also there came to that feast King Nentres of Garlot, with seven hundred knights with him. Also there came to the feast the King of Scotland, with six hundred knights with him, and he was but a young man. Also there came to the feast a king that was called the King with the hundred knights, but he and his men were passing well beseen at all points. Also there came the king of Carados, with five hundred knights. And King Arthur was glad of their coming, for he weened that all the kings and knights had come for great love, and to have done him worship at his feast. Whereof the king made great joy, and sent the kings and knights great presents. But the kings were to none receive, but rebuked the messenger shamefully, and said they had no joy to receive no gifts of a beardless boy that was come of low blood, and sent him word they would none of his gifts, but that they were come to give him gifts, with hard swords betwixt the neck and the shoulders, and therefore they came thither, so they told to the messengers plainly, for it was great shame to all them to see such a boy to have a rule of so noble a realm as this land was. With this answer the messenger departed, and told to King Arthur this answer. Wherefore, by the advice of his barons, he took him to a strong tower, with five hundred good men with him. And all the kings aforesaid, in a manner, laid a siege to fore him. But King Arthur was well victuated and within fifteen days there came Merlin among them, into the city of Carleon. Then all the kings were passing glad of Merlin, and asked him, For what cause is that boy Arthur made your king? Sirs, said Merlin, I shall tell you the cause, for he is King Uther Pendragon's son, born in wedlock, gotten on Igraine, the duke's wife of Tintagel. Then he is a bastard, they all said. Nay, said Merlin, after the death of the duke, more than three hours was Arthur begotten, and thirteen days after King Uther wedded a grain, and therefore I prove him he is no bastard. 
and who saith nay, he shall be king, and overcome all his enemies. And, or he die, he shall be long king of all England, and have under his obsessance Wales, Ireland, and Scotland, and more realms than I will now rehearse. Some of the kings had marvelled of Merlin's words, and deemed well that it should be as he said, and some of them laughed him to scorn, as King Lot, and more other called him a witch. But then they were accorded with Merlin, that King Arthur should come out and speak with the kings, and to come safe, and to go safe. Such surance there was made. So Merlin went unto King Arthur, and told him how he had done, and bade him fear not, but come out boldly, and speak with them, and spare them not, but answer them as their king and chieftain. For ye shall overcome them all, whether they will or nil. CHAPTER Nine. Then King Arthur came out of his tower, and had under his gown a jesserant of double mail, and there went with him the Archbishop of Canterbury, and Sir Bedouin of Britain, and Sir Kay, and Sir Brastius. These were the men of most worship that were with him, and when they were met there was no meekness, but stout words on both sides. But always King Arthur answered them, and said he would make them to bow, and he lived. Wherefore they departed with wrath, and King Arthur bade keep them well, and they bade the king keep him well. So the king returned him to the tower again, and armed him and all his knights. "'What will ye do?' said Merlin to the kings. "'Ye were better for to stint, for ye shall not here prevail, though ye were ten times so many. "'Be we well advised to be afeard of a dream-reader?' said King Lot. With that Merlin vanished away, and came to King Arthur, and bade him set on them fiercely. And in the meanwhile there were three hundred good men, of the best that were with the kings. They went straight unto King Arthur, and that comforted him greatly. Sir, said Merlin to Arthur, fight not with the sword that ye had by miracle. Till that ye see ye go unto the worst, then draw it out and do your best. So forwithal King Arthur set upon them in their lodging, and Sir Bedouin, Sir Kay, and Sir Brastius slew on the right hand, and on the left hand that it was marvel. And always King Arthur on horseback laid on with his sword, and did marvellous deeds of arms, that many of the kings had great joy of his deeds and hardiness. Then King Lot brake out on the back side, and the king with the hundred knights, and King Carados, and set on Arthur fiercely behind him. With that Sir Arthur turned with his knights, and smote behind and before, and ever Sir Arthur was in the foremost press, till his horse was slain underneath him. And therewith King Lot smote down King Arthur. With that his four knights received him and set him on horseback. Then he drew his sword Excalibur, but it was so bright in his enemy's eyes that it gave light like thirty torches. And therewith he put them aback, and slew much people. And then the commons of Carleon arose with clubs and staves, and slew many knights. But all the kings held them together with their knights that were left alive, and so fled and departed. And Merlin came unto Arthur, and counselled him to follow them no further. CHAPTER Ten. So, after the feast and journey, King Arthur drew him unto London, and so, by the counsel of Merlin, the king let call his barons to counsel. For Merlin had told the king that the six kings that made war upon him would in all haste be a rogue on him and on his lands. Wherefore the king asked counsel at them all. They could no counsel give, but said they were big enough. Ye say well, said Arthur, I thank you for your good courage, but will ye all that loveth me speak with Merlin? Ye know well that he hath done much for me, and he knoweth many things, and when he is afore you, I would that ye prayed him heartily of his best advice. All the barons said they would pray him and desire him, 
so Merlin was sent for, and fair desired of all the barons to give them best counsel. "'I shall say you,' said Merlin, "'I warn you all, your enemies are passing strong for you, and they are good men of arms as be alive. And by this time they have gotten to them four kings more, and a mighty duke. And unless that our king have more chivalry with him than he may make within the bounds of his own realm, and he fight with them in battle, he shall be overcome and slain. What were best to do in this cause? said all the barons. I shall tell you, said Merlin, mine advice. There are two brethren beyond the sea, and they be kings both, and marvellous good men of their hands, and that one hight King Ban of Benwick, and that other hight King Bors of Gaul, that is France. And on these two kings warreth a mighty man of men, the King Claudas, and striveth with them for a castle, and great war is betwixt them. But this Claudas is so mighty of goods, whereof he getteth good knights, that he putteth these two kings most part to the worse. Wherefore this is my counsel, that our king and sovereign lord send unto the king's ban and bores by two trusty knights, with letters well devised, that and they will come and see King Arthur and his court, and so help him in his wars, that he will be sworn unto them to help them in their wars against King Claudas. Now what say ye unto this counsel? said Merlin. This is well counselled, said the king and all the barons. Right so, in all haste, there was ordained to go two knights on the message unto the two kings. So were there made letters in the pleasant wise, according unto King Arthur's desire. Ulfius and Brastius were made the messengers, and so rode forth well horsed, and well armed, and as the guise was that time, and so passed the sea, and rode toward the city of Benwick. And there besides were eight knights that despised them, and at a straight passage they met with Ulfius and Brastius, and would have taken them prisoners. So they prayed them that they might pass, for they were messengers unto King Ban and Bors, sent from King Arthur. Therefore, said the eight knights, ye shall die or be prisoners, for we be knights of King Claudas. And therewith two of them dressed their spears, and Ulfius and Brastius dressed their spears, and ran together with great roundum. And Claudas's knights brake their spears, and theirs to held, and bare the two knights out of their saddles to the earth, and so left them lying, and rode their ways. And the other six knights rode afore to a passage to meet with them again. And so Ulfius and Brastius smote other two down, and so passed on their ways. And at the fourth passage there met two for two, and both were laid unto the earth. So there was none of the eight knights, but he was sore hurt or bruised. And when they came to Benwick, it fortuned they were both kings, Ban and Bors. And when it was told the kings that there were come messengers, there was sent unto them two knights of worship. The one hight Lyonces, lord of the country of Pion, and Seferiance, a worshipful knight. Anon they asked from whence they came, and they said from King Arthur, king of England. So they took them in their arms, and made great joy each of other. But anon, as the two kings wist they were messengers of Arthur's, there was made no tarrying, but forthwith they spake with the knights, and welcomed them in the faithfullest wise, and said they were most welcome unto them before all the kings living. And therewith they kissed the letters, and delivered them. And when Ban and Bors understood the letters, then they were more welcome than they were before. And after the haste of the letters, they gave them this answer, that they would fulfil the desire of King Arthur's writing, and Ulfius and Brastius, tarry there as long as they would, they should have such cheer as might be made them in those marches. 
Then Alpheus and Brastias told the kings of the adventure at their passages of the eight knights. Ha ha! said Ban and Bors, they were my good friends. I would I had wist of them. They should not have escaped so. So Alpheus and Brastias had good cheer and great gifts, as much as they might bear away, and had their answer by mouth and by writing, that these two kings would come unto Arthur in all the haste that they might. So the two knights rode on afore, and passed the sea, and came to their lord, and told him how they had sped, whereof King Arthur was passing glad. At what time suppose ye the two kings will be here? Sir, said they, afore all Hallowmas. Then the king let purvey for a great feast, and let a cry of great jousts. And by all Hallowmas the two kings were come over the sea with three hundred knights, well arrayed both for the peace and for the war. And King Arthur met with them ten miles out of London, and there was great joy as could be thought or made. And on all Hallowmas at the great feast, sat in the hall the three kings, and Sir Kay Sensual served in the hall, and Sir Lucas the butler, that was Duke Cornus's son, and Sir Griflet, that was the son of Cardol. These three knights had the rule of all the service that served the kings. And anon, as they had washed and risen, all knights that would joust made them ready. By then they were ready on horseback, there were seven hundred knights. And Arthur, Ban, and Bors, with the Archbishop of Canterbury, and Sir Ector, Kay's father, they were in a place covered with cloth of gold like an hall, with ladies and gentlewomen, for to behold who did best, and thereon to give judgment. CHAPTER Eleven. And King Arthur and the two kings let depart the seven hundred knights in two parties. And there were three hundred knights of the realm of Benwick, and of Gaul turned on the other side. Then they dressed their shields, and began to couch their spears many good knights. Sir Griflet was the first that met with a knight. One Landinus, and they met so eagerly that all men had wonder and they so fought that their shields fell to pieces, and horse and man fell to the earth. And both the French knight and the English knight lay so long that all men weened they had been dead. When Lucas the butler saw Griflet so lie, he horsed him again anon, and they too did marvellous deeds of arms with many bachelors. Also Sir Kay came out of an ambushment, with five knights with him, and they six smote other six down. But Sir Kay did that day marvellous deeds of arms, that there was none did so well as he that day. Then there came Landinus and Gracian, two knights of France, and did passing well that all men praised them. Then came there Sir Placidus, a good knight, and met with Sir Kay, and smote him down horse and man. Wherefore Sir Griflet was wroth, and met with Sir Placidus so hard, that horse and man fell to the earth. But when the five knights wist that Sir Kay had a fall, they were wroth out of wit, and therewith each of them five bare down a knight. When King Arthur and the two kings saw them begin to wax wroth on both parties, they leapt on small hackneys, and let cry that all men should depart unto their lodging. And so they went home and unarmed them, and so to even song and supper. And after, the three kings went into a garden, and gave the prize unto Sir Kay, and to Lucas the butler, and unto Sir Griflet. And then they went unto council, and with them Grenbaus, the brother unto Sir Ban and Bors, a wise clerk. And thither went Ulfius and Brastius and Merlin. And after they had been in council, they went unto bed. And on the morn they heard mass, and to dinner, and so to their council and made many arguments what were best to do. At the last they were concluded, that Merlin should go with a token of King Ban, and that was a ring, unto his men, and King Bors and Gracian and Placidas should go again, and keep their castles and their countries. As for, dread of King Claudas, 
King Ban of Benwick, and King Bors of Gaul had ordained them, and so passed the sea and came to Benwick. And when the people saw King Ban's ring, and Gracian and Placidas, they were glad, and asked how the kings fared, and made great joy of their welfare and cording, and according unto the sovereign lord's desire, the men of war made them ready in all haste possible, so that they were fifteen thousand on horse and foot, and they had great plenty of victual with them, by Merlin's provision. But Gracian and Placidas were left to furnish and garnish the castles, for dread of King Claudas. Right so Merlin passed the sea, well victualled both by water and by land, and when he came to the sea he sent home the footmen again, and took no more with him but ten thousand men on horseback, the most part men of arms, and so shipped and passed the sea into England, and landed at Dover. And through the wit of Merlin he had the host northward, the privatest way that could be thought, unto the forest of Bedigrain, and there in a valley he lodged them secretly. Then rode Merlin unto Arthur and the two kings, and told them how he had sped, whereof they had great marvel, that man on earth might speed so soon, and go and come. So Merlin told them ten thousand were in the forest of Bedigrain, well armed at all points. Then was there no more to say, but to horseback went all of the host as Arthur had afore purveyed. So with twenty thousand he passed by night and day. But there was made such an ordinance afore by Merlin, that there should no man of war ride, nor go in no country on this side Trent Water, but if he had a token from King Arthur, wherethrough the king's enemies durst not ride as they did to fore to espy. End of Book 1, Chapters 7 to 11. Chapters 12 to 16, Book 1, Volume 1 of La Morte de Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are on the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Crystal Layton. La Morte de Arthur, Volume 1. By Sir Thomas Mallory, Book One, Chapters Twelve to Sixteen. Chapter Twelve. And so, within a little space, the three kings came into the castle of Bedigrain, and found there a passing fair fellowship, and well beseen whereof they had great joy, and victual they wanted none. This was the cause of the northern post, that they were reared for the despite and rebuke the six kings had at Carlion. And those six kings by their names get unto them five other kings, and thus they began to gather their people. And now they swear that for weal nor woe they should not leave other, till they had destroyed Arthur. And then they made an oath. The first that began the oath was the Duke of Cabinet, that he would bring with him five thousand men of arms, the which were ready on horseback. Then sware King Brandagoras of Strangor that he would bring five thousand men of arms on horseback. Then sware King Clarence of Northumberland he would bring three thousand men of arms. Then sware the King of the Hundred Knights that was a passing good man and a young that he would bring four thousand men of arms on horseback. Then there swore King Lot, a passing good knight and Sir Gawain's father, that he would bring five thousand men of arms on horseback. Also there sworn King Uriens, that was Uwain's father, of the land of Gore, and he would bring six thousand men of arms on horseback. And also there swore King Idres of Cornwall, that he would bring five thousand men of arms on horseback. And there swore King Cradlemas to bring five thousand men on horseback. Also there swore King Aquisance of Ireland to bring five thousand men of arms on horseback. Also there swore King Nentris to bring five thousand men of arms on horseback. Also there swore King Carados to bring five thousand men of arms on horseback. So their whole host was a clean men of arms on horseback fifty thousand, and a foot ten thousand of good men's bodies. Then were they soon ready, and mounted upon horse, and sent forth their four riders, 
For these elven kings in their ways laid a siege unto the castle of Bedegrain, and so they departed and drew toward Arthur, and left few to abide at the siege. For the castle of Bedegrain was holden of King Arthur, and the men that were therein were Arthur's. Chapter 13 So by Merlin's advice there were sent four riders to skim the country, and they met with the four riders of the north, and made them to tell which way the host came, and then they told it to Arthur, and by King Ban and Boris's counsel, they let burn and destroy all the country for them. There they should ride. The king with the hundred knights met a wonder dream two nights before the battle, that there blew a great wind, and blew down their castles and their towns, and after that came a water, and bare it all away. All that heard of the seven said it was a token of a great battle. Then by counsel of Merlin, when they wist which way the elven kings would ride and lodge that night, at midnight they set upon them, as they were in their pavilions. But the scout watch by their host cried, Lords at arms, for here be your enemies at your hand. Chapter 14 Then King Arthur and King Bane and King Bors, with their good and trusty knights, set on them so fiercely that they made them overthrow their pavilions on their heads. But the elven kings, by many prowess of arms, took a fair campaign. But there was slain that morrow tide ten thousand good men's bodies, and so they had afore them a strong passage, yet were they fifty thousand of hardy men. Then it drew toward day. Now shall ye do by mine advice, said Merlin, unto the three kings. I would that King Bane and King Bors, with their fellowship of ten thousand men, were put in a wood here beside, in an ambushment, and keep them privy, and that they be laid, or the light of the day come, and that they stir not till ye and your knights have fought with them long. And when it is daylight, dress your battle even afore them in the passage, that they may see all your host, for then will they be the more hardy when they see you but about twenty thousand men, and cause them to be the gladder to suffer you and your host to come over the passage. All the three kings and the whole barons said that Merlin said passingly well, and it was done anon as Merlin had devised. So on the morn, when either host saw other, the host of the north was well comforted. Then to Ophius and Brastius were delivered three thousand men of arms, and they set on them fiercely in the passage, and slew on the right hand, and on the left hand, that it was wonder to tell. When that the eleven kings saw that there was so few of fellowship did such deeds of arms, they were ashamed, and set on them again fiercely. And there was still Ophius's horse slain under him, but he did marvellously well on foot. But the Duke of Eustace of Cambinet, and King Clarence of Northumberland, were alway grievous and Ophius. Then Brastius saw his fellow fared, so withal he smote the duke with the spear. That horse and man fell down. That saw King Clarence and returned unto Brastius, and either smote other so that horse and man went to earth. And so they lay long astonied, and their horses' knees brass to the hard bone. Then came Sir Kay the seneschal, with six fellows with him, and did passing well. With that came the elven kings, and there was Griflet put to the earth, horse and man, and Lucas the butler, horse and man, by King Brandagoras, and King Idress, and King Aquisance. Then waxed the medley passing hard on both parties. When Sir Kay saw Griflet on foot, he rode on King Nentris, and smote him down, and led his horse unto Sir Graflet, and horsed him again. Also Sir Kay with the same spear smote down King Lot, and heard him passing sore. That saw the king with the hundred knights, and ran unto Sir Kay, and smote him down, and took his horse, and gave him King Lot. Whereof he said, Gramercy. When Sir Griflet saw Sir Kay and Lucas the butler on foot, he took a sharp spear, great and square, and rode to Penel, a good man of arms, and smote horse and man down. And then he took his horse, and gave him unto Sir Kay. Then King Lot saw King Nentris on foot. He ran unto Malot de la Roche, and smote him down, horse and man, and gave King Nentris the horse, and horsed him again. Also the King of the Hundred Knights saw King Edris on foot. Then he ran into Gwyniart de Blois, and smote him down, horse and man, and gave King Edris the horse. 
and horsed him again, and King Lot smote down Clarion still a forest savage, and gave the horse unto Duke Eustace. And so when they had horsed the kings again, they drew them, all eleven kings, together, and said they would be revenged of the damage that they had taken that day. The meanwhile came in Sir Ector with an eager countenance, and found Ulfius and Brastius on foot in great peril of death, that were foul defoiled under horse feet. Then Arthur, as a lion, ran into King Cradlement of North Wales, and smote him through the left side, that the horse and the king fell down, and then he took the horse by the rein, and led him unto Ulfius, and said, Have this horse, mine old friend, for a great need hast thou of horse. Gramercy, said Ulfius. Then Sir Arthur did so marvellously at arms, that all men had wonder. When the king with the hundred knights saw King Cradlement on foot, he ran unto Sir Ector that was well horsed, Sir Kay's father, and smote horse and man down, and gave the horse unto the king and horsed him again. And when King Arthur saw the king ride on Sir Ector's horse, he was wroth, and with his sword he smote the king on the helm, that a quarter of the helm and shield fell down, and so the sword carved down into the horse's neck, and so the king and the horse fell down to the ground. Then Sir Kay came unto Sir Morganor, seneschal with the king of the hundred knights, and smote him down, horse and man, and led the horse unto his father, Sir Ector. Then Sir Ector ran unto a knight, hight Lardens, and smote horse and man down, and led the horse unto Sir Brastius, that great need have in a horse, and was greatly defoiled. When Brastius beheld Lucas the butler, that lay like a dead man under the horse's feet, and ever Sir Grefflet did marvellously for to rescue him, and there were always fourteen knights on Sir Lucas. Then Brastius smote one of them on the helm, then it went to the teeth, and he rode to another, and smote him, that the arm flew into the field. Then he went to the third, and smote him on the shoulder, that shoulder and arm flew into the field. And when Grifflet saw rescues, he smote a knight on the temples, that head and helm went to earth, and Grifflet took the horse of that knight, and led him unto Sir Lucas, and bade him mount upon the horse and revenge his hurts. For Brastius had slain a knight two four and horse Grifflet. Chapter fifteen. Then Lucas saw King Aquisance the late had slain Morris de la Roche, and Lucas ran to him with a short spear that was great, that he gave him such a fall that the horse fell down to the earth. Also Lucas found there on foot Bloas de la Flandre and Sir Gwenas, two hardy knights, and in that woodness that Lucas was in he slew two bachelors and horsed them again. Then waxed the battle passing hard on both parties, but Arthur was glad that his knights were horsed again, and then they fought together, that the noise and sound rang by the water and the wood, wherefore King Bane and King Bors made them ready, and dressed their shields in harness. And they were so courageous that many knights shook and bevered for eagerness. All this while Lucas, and Guinness, and Bryant, and Bellius of Flanders, held strong medley against six kings, that was King Lot, King Nentris, King Brendagoras, King Addressed, King Urians, and King Aquisens. So with the help of Sir Kay and of Sir Griflet, they held these six kings hard, that unneath they had any power to defend them. But when Sir Arthur saw the battle would not be ended by no manner, he fared wood as a line, and steered his horse here and there, on the right hand and on the left hand, that he stinted not till he had slain twenty knights. Also he wounded King Lot sore on the shoulder, and made him to leave that ground. For Sir Kay and Griflet did with King Arthur the great deeds of arms. Then Ulfius and Brastius and Sir Ector encountered against the Duke Eustace and King Cradlement and King Clarence of Northumberland and King Crados and against the King with the Hundred Knights. So these knights encountered with these kings, that they made them to avoid the ground. Then King Lot made great dole for his damages and his fellows and said unto the ten kings, but if ye will do as I devise, we shall be slain and destroyed. Let me have the king with the hundred knights, and King Aquisance, and King Idress, and the Duke of Cambinet, and we five kings will have fifteen thousand men of arms with us, and we will go apart while ye six kings hold medley with twelve thousand, and we see that ye have foughten with them long. Then will we come on fiercely, and else shall we never match them, said King Lot, but by this mean. So they departed as they were devised, and six kings made their party strong against Arthur, and made great war long. In the meanwhile brake the ambush of King Bran and King Boris, and Lyonses and Ferians, 
had the vanguard, and they two knights met with King Idris in his fellowship, and there began a great medley of breaking of spears and smiting of swords, with slaying of men and horses, and King Idris was near at discomfiture. That saw acquiesced the king, and put Leonis's and Farians in point of death. For the Duke of Cabinet came on withal with a great fellowship, so these two knights were in great danger of their lives, that they were fain to return, but always they rescued themselves and their fellowship marvellously. When King Bor saw those knights put aback, it grieved him sore. Then he came on so fast that his fellowship seemed as black as end. When King Lot had espied King Boris, he knew him well. Then he said, O oh, Jesse, defend us from death and horrible maims, for I see well we be in great peril of death. For I see yonder a king, one of the most worshipfullest men, and one of the best knights of the world, is inclined unto his fellowship. What is he, said the king with a hundred knights? It is, said King Lot, King Bors of Gaul. I marvel how they came into this country without witting of us all. It was by Merlin's advice, said the knight. As for him, said King Carados, I will encounter with King Bors, and you will rescue me when Mister is. Go on, said they all. We will do all that we may. Then King Carados and his host rode on a soft pace till so that they came as nigh King Boris as bow draught. Then either battle let their horse run as fast as they might. And Bleoberis, that was godson unto King Boris, he bare his chief standard that he was passing good night. Now shall we see, said King Boris, how these northern Britons can bear the arms. And King Boris encountered with the knight, and smote him throughout with the spear, that he fell dead unto the earth, and after drew his sword, and did marvellous deeds of arms that all parties had great wonder thereof, and his knights failed not, but did their part, and King Caradars was smitten to the earth. When that came the king with the hundred knights, and rescued King Caradars mightily by force of arms, for he was a passing good knight of a king, and but a young man. Chapter 16 By then came unto the field King Ban, as fiercely as a lion, with bonds of green and thereupon gold, Ha ha! said King Lot, we must be discomfited, for yonder I see the most valiant knight of the world, and the man of the most renown, for such two brethren as King Ban and King Bors are not living. Wherefore we must needs void or die, and but if we avoid manly and wisely there is but death. When King Ban came into the battle, he came in so fiercely that the strokes rebound again from the wood and the water. Wherefore King Lot wept for pity and dole that he saw so many good knights take their end. But through the great force of King Bane, they made both the northern battles that were departed hurled together for great dread. And the three kings and their knights slew on ever, that it was pity on to behold that multitude of the people that fled. But King Lot and King of the Hundred Knights and King Morganor gathered the people together passing nightly, and a great prowess of arms, and held the battle all that day like hard. When the king of the hundred knights beheld the great damage that King Ban did, he thrust unto him with his horse, and smote him on high upon the helm. A great stroke, and a stony at him sore. Then King Ban was wrought with him, and followed him fiercely. The other saw that, and cast upon his shield, and spurred his horse forward. But the stroke of King Ban fell down, and carved a cantle off the shield and the sword slid down by the herbrick behind his back, and cut through the trapping of steel and the horse even in two pieces, that the sword fell the earth. Then the king of the hundred knights voided the horse lightly, and with his sword he broached the horse of King Ban through and through. With that King Ban voided lightly from the dead horse, and then King Ban smote that the other so eagerly, and smote him on the helm that he fell to the earth. Also in that ear he fell the king Morganor, and there was a great slaughter of good knights and much people. But then came into the press King Arthur, and found King Bane, standing among dead men and dead horses, fighting on foot as a wood lion, that there came none nigh him, as far as he might reach with his sword. But he caught a grievous buffet, whereas King Arthur had great pity, and Arthur was so bloody that by his shield there might no man know him, for all was blood and brains in his sword. And as Arthur looked by him, he saw a knight that was passingly well horsed. And therewith Sir Arthur ran to him and smote him on the helm, that his sword went into his teeth, and the knight sank down to the earth dead. For I trust in God, mine ear is not such, but done of some may sore repent this. 
I will well, said Arthur, for I see your deeds full actual, nevertheless. I might not come at you at that time. Arthur took the horse by the rein and led him unto King Ban, and said, Fair brother, have this horse, for he hath great mister thereof, and me repenteth sore of your great damage. It shall be soon revenged, said King Ban, for I trust in God mine error is not such, but some of them may sore repent this. I will well, said Arthur, for I see your deeds full actual, nevertheless. I might not come at you at that time. But when King Ban was mounted on horseback, then there began a new battle, that which was sore and hard and passing great slaughter. And so through great force King Arthur, King Ban, and King Bors made their knights a little to withdraw them. But alway the eleven kings with their chivalry never turned back, and so withdrew them to a little wood, and so over a little river, and there they rested them, for on the night they might have no rest on the field. But when the elven kings and knights put them on a heap altogether, as men adreaded and out of all comfort, but there was no man might pass them, they held them so hard together, both behind and before, that King Arthur had marveled of their deeds of arms, and was passing wroth. Ah, Sir Arthur, said King Ban and King Bors, blame them not, for they do so as good men ought to do. For by my faith, said King Ban, they are the best fighting men and knights of most prowess, that ever I saw or heard speak of, and those elven kings are men of great worship. And if they were longing unto you, there were no king under the heaven, had such elven knights, and of such worship. I may not love them, said Arthur, they would destroy me. That wot we well, said King Ban and King Bors, for they are your mortal enemies, and that hath been proved aforehand, and this day they have done their part, and that is great pity of their willfulness. Then all the eleven kings drew them together, and then said King Lot, Lords, ye must other ways than ye do, or else the great loss is behind. Ye may see what people we have lost, and what good men we lose, because we wait always on these footmen, and ever in eving of one of the footmen we lose ten horsemen for him. Therefore this is mine advice, let us put our footmen from us, for it is near night, for the noble Arthur will not tarry on the footmen, but they may save themselves, the wood is near hand. And when we horsemen be together, look every each of you kings, let make such ordinance that none break upon pain of death. And who that seeth any man dress him to flee, lightly that he be slain, for it is better that we slay a coward, than through a coward all we to be slain. How say ye, said King Lot, answer me all ye kings. It is well said, quoth King Dentris. So said the king of the hundred knights, the same said the king of Carados, and king Urians, so did king Idres, and king Brandagoras, and so did king Cradlement, and the duke of Cabinet. The same said king Clarence, and king Acquiescence, and swear they would never fail other neither for life nor death. And whoso that fled, but did as they did, should be slain. Then they amended their harness, and righted their shields, and took new spears, and set them on their thighs, and stood still as it had been a plump of wood. End of Book 1, Chapters 12 to 16「Book One, Chapter Seventeen, Volume One of Le Mort d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine Fitz.